um, start the presentation. All right, thanks, Tori. Appreciate it. So I will go ahead and just give some overview information really quick about the Enterprise Zone in the state of Virginia, if you don't know about it. So we do, of course, have 45 zones right now that encompasses 34 counties, 20 cities, and 12 towns. And just as a snapshot of grant year 2022 and the grants that were awarded of the job creation grant, we had 38 businesses that created or retained 2,745 jobs and were awarded a little bit over $1.7 million in grant awards during for their 2022. For the real property investment grant, oh, I haven't had that yet. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry, for the Real Property Investment Grant, we had 104 properties that had over $466 million in qualified real property investments, receiving about $9.3 million in awards. And so just as a reminder for the program timeline, we are talking about grant year 2023 awards at this moment, which uh, funds were appropriated by the General Assembly during their 23 session. And both the job creation grant and uh, real property investment grant, this is for jobs created in 2023 and any final placed in service documentation that was received during 2023 for buildings or properties. And the application deadline is April 1st of 2024. That is a Monday this year, just as a FYI. And just as a reminder for the submission process, we do not accept hard copies applications. The deadline, once again, for all applications and supplemental information is April 1st. It is at 11.59 p.m. I encourage you not to wait until the last minute. Also, just as a reminder, we typically do not have um, support after five o'clock on that Monday. So you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna try to do that beforehand. All, again, all forms and documents do need to be submitted by that time. And while the link is on this website or on this um, slide, these are on our um, website. And also you'll, you know, afterwards probably be getting a follow-up email for that admission portal where is, you can apply, the applications are, and all the supplemental information. So just uh, this is just a snapshot of what that application system portal looks like. Um, I do joke with Tori and Kate that you have to have you have to zoom in pretty tight to be able to see that. But this is just showing you the place where you're going to click on the real property investment grant submission application and then of course all the supplemental forms. So the application system is designed or set up where on the left hand side when you're looking at the screen you have the real property investment grant. The middle of the screen the middle box has the job creation grant information and then on the right hand side is the CPA attestation information. So just reviewing a little bit of the eligibility associated, what makes a building or facility or what constitutes a building or facility? Those are what's eligible for the real property investment grant. Of course, it does have to be located within the enterprise zone. If you're unsure, you want to contact your local zone or local economic development office to make sure that that property was, is within the zone. We do classify real property investment grants under two different classifications or the um, facilities themselves. One is considered a building, the other is considered a facility. A building, of course, is a freestanding um, structure or it's a structure that may be related, um, let's just say freestanding and unrelated in function to other buildings or structures. So there could be one owner, there could be common ownership, but it's leased to tenants. Uh, the biggest thing here is the owner really doesn't have say over the general management hours, operations, that type of thing. An example of that could be a um, like a Walmart shopping center or some type of center that has different types of businesses in it. 
The facility, of course, can be a group of buildings. Uh, this can be maybe a manufacturer that has multiple buildings uh, co-located on a single physical location. They um, are related in operation. They're under common ownership. And this uh, example, while we say shopping center here, I call a strip mall shopping center, just myself, but maybe a mall could be uh, considered a facility as well, in addition to maybe a manufacturing location that has multiple buildings on its site. So also, may, what are the, go ahead, may, where are the eligible just, properties? Oh, yes. Sorry, this is Tim. Um, the, if a uh, business is, expanding their existing facility and they're adding new facility are they eligible for this too um tim actually do you mind hanging on until we get to our question and answer section oh, and just oh, ask at the end? Yeah. yeah i'm sorry that's no not a problem it's okay we're just on short on time so as far as eligible properties the rpig is available to investors that are taking on rehab expansion or new construction projects within the boundaries of the zone and the end use of that building or facility does have to be for commercial which could include office or retail industrial or it could be a mixed use building but at least 30 percent of that usable floor space does have to be devoted to the commercial office or industrial usage And who is the eligible applicant? The qualified zone investor is an entity or individual that's capitalizing on or expensing the costs associated with the real property investment. So this could be the property owner, either occupant or non-occupant, multiple owners. Um, if there are multiple owners, the rights to the real property investment grant qualification does need to be coordinated with the other owners. Tenant, if a tenant's making those leasehold improvements, they may apply for the grant with the owner's with the owner's permission. However, um, the improvements do need to be capitalized or expensed um, by the tenant for tax purposes. And a, a developer does have the right to apply for the grant, even if they've sold the facility or sold the development, but they should be reflected in the sale documents of the property. Essentially, the owner, current owner of the property does have the first rights to uh, the grant itself. And this uh, does cover two different things of eligibility requirements associated with minimum thresholds as well as maximum grant eligibility. So um, every zone investor must meet a minimum threshold for that grant year to be able to apply for the real property investment grant. And um, they also are capped at a certain amount based off of how much they've invested. So if your total investment is less than $5 million, the maximum grant you're eligible for is hundred up to $100,000. But if the zone investor invests more than $5 million, they may be eligible up to $200,000. Uh, below that, you're going to see also a chart that talks about the type of construction and what that minimum threshold is. It's $500,000 for new construction, but rehab and expansion does have a lower threshold of $100,000 in those qualified real property investments, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then also, if it's a solar project that does reduce the thresholds by $50,000, and there is an opportunity for solar-only projects to have $0 in qualified real property property investment. And to calculate, which we'll go over in a little bit more detail later, is the grant amount is 20% of the qualified real property investment over that respective threshold or eligibility threshold. I think the next slide gives us just a little bit of example of that mathematical formula. Uh, on the top row there, you'll see under new construction, they had an investment of $1 million. The threshold was $500,000. So if you do the subtraction, that leaves you the eligible grant amount of $500,000 or eligible grant funds, eligible qualified real property investment of $500,000. 20% of that, which is the grant rate, is $100,000. So that would be your grant request. Now, this slide does show if there's proration associated with the real property investment grant. I'm sure Kate will mention this, but the job creation grant under the Code of Virginia is fully funded 
funded first, and then the Rural Property Investment Grants are funded after that. The last two years, the we have not had proration, so the grants have been fully funded, but this is an example that if basically the um, request exceed the amount L that we have available, then it, we would have to implement the proration, which is based off the number of grants. So if that's the case and the grant request was $100,000 and for some reason the proration amount was 88% or 88 cents on the dollar, then the grant award would be $88,000 to that particular investor. And we'll go ahead and go to the next slide so we don't have to. So the qualified investments, what are qualified real property investments that can be eligible? They are the hard construction costs associated with the exterior, interior, structural, mechanical, and electrical improvements that are necessary to construct, expand, or rehabilitate a building for those eligible uses. This can include excavation, grading, paving, installation, uh, landscape and land improvements on the property line. I'll include that. So this is, you know, carpentry, painting, plumbing, doors, windows, drywall. Uh, that's just a few examples there. Page 13 of the Real Property Investment Grant Manual does give you a more extensive list of qualified investments. It also gives you ineligible costs, but here are some examples. Purchase of property costs, acquisition costs is not eligible. Um, architectural fees, things that we refer to such as soft cost, closing cost, business personal property, furniture fixtures, insurance, anything beyond the property line, utility connection fees. Those are some of the examples of ineligible costs. And again, there's a more extensive list in the grant manual. How do you calculate your award? This is the dollar amount of the grants based off that qualified real property investment. So looking here, your grant award is 20% of the qualified real property investment made in excess of the respective eligibility threshold, which is either the $100,000 or $500,000 or that reduced amount based off of if it's a solar uh, project. Of course, the grant award is capped based on the amount of investment and grant awards are capped per building or facility over five years, and that's a five-year consecutive term. Um, we've been asked about this a few times this year, probably some in the past. Your first year of your five years in the grant year is the year, the grant year. So, for example, if the first year that property is receiving a grant is for grant year 23, then that's going to be 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27. That property or grant will be eligible to apply again for grant year 28. And again, that's up to the $100,000 or $200,000 uh, threshold. This is a calculation example. I'm going to go over here to this last column to give you an example of that cap amount. So if this person had the qualified real property investment of $2 million, it's a rehab or expansion. So you're going to uh, subtract that $100,000 minimum threshold, leaving you grant eligible QRPI of 1.9 million, 20% of that is 380,000. However, that exceeds the $100,000 eligible grant amount because it was an under $5 million investment. So the grant request from that investor would be $100,000. Just to mention very quickly, the solar eligibility in 2019, there was a legislative change allowing uh, solar components to qualify at a lower threshold. It does reduce that new construction or um, rehab expansion threshold by $50,000. If you have a solar only improvement, meaning that you're adding something to your building or facility like solar panels, then you have a $0 threshold as long as you have spent $50,000 to $100,000 on that. And of course, if it's part of the larger project, it reduces by $50,000. And just as a reminder, this is making solar improvements. This is not solar farms, those types of uh, projects. This is making improvements or new construction to your uh, building for other uses. And that's just a quick example of that uh, calculation. If it's a rehab or expansion project with solar, you'll see that $100,000 
and um, it reduced that threshold from 100,000 to 50,000, making your grant eligible QRPI at 50,000 and 20% is 10,000. So your grant award or grant request would be $10,000. So this is a really quick uh, slide on investment continuum. There are two things I want to mention on here, and that has to do with the fact that there's a sweet spot associated with rehab and expansion and new construction. If you spend $100,000 on rehab and expansion, in order to be able to cap out at that maximum grant eligibility of $100,000, you really want to be spending about $600,000 on that rehab or expansion. However, if it's new construction and you want to be able to um, capitalize on that under five million uh, threshold or expenditure and be able to receive the maximum grant of a hundred thousand, you'd want to spend around a million dollars. The next part of this does show that if you want to either unlock or be able to um, access the additional hundred thousand, which gives you up to the two hundred thousand dollar grant you're going to want to be spending um, that that shows you that you can open it up if you are to spend over five million dollars. So you start at six hundred thousand, you've got to go over five hundred million to unlock that extra hundred thousand on rehab or expansion. And then, of course, if it's a new construction, if you're at a million, but you go up to five million, then you would be unlocking an additional hundred thousand dollars. So what is the application process itself? You are eligible for the upcoming grant year of 23, but the property must have been placed in service January 1st, 23 to December 31st of 2023. A copy of your final place in service documentation must be submitted. And what is examples of final place in service documents? It's your certificate of occupancy, your building inspection, or a third party inspection, which these are uh, detailed more in that RPIG manual. What are the required materials that you're going to have to have? We no longer require a hard copy of the Enterprise Zone Real Property Investment Grant application. Everything is done through the online portal. The other materials that you will have to include are Commonwealth of Virginia W-9, an applicant declaration form, a local zone administrator review form. Both of those will need to be signed, um, placed in service documentation, supplemental forms when applicable, applicable and the CPI attestation report, which is required for all real property investment grants. This is just a reminder, you do need to use the Commonwealth of Virginia W-9. Your federal ID number is required. However, the UEI, which is the unique entity identifier, is not required. Please remember there's a legal address and a remittance address at the bottom of this form. The legal address, of course, is where for the business, but the remittance address is where paper checks are mailed. So make sure this is correct and accurate on um, your records of where payments should be sent to. This is just a copy of or a screenshot of the applicant declaration form. There is one form that's being used for both real property investment grant and job creation grant. It does um, it does need to be invest or filled out by the zone investor, um, and they're verifying that the all of this information is true and accurate. And they do need to have what we call a wet signature or a true signature on here. Uh, either through PIN or a DocuSign legitimate type of online signature. The LZA review form, this is uh, the top part's going to be completed by you, the zone investor, and then starting with the property ID number, that is where it comes in your local zone administrator. They're going to enter that information, and then also they're going to put their other information, and again, they need to sign this form. This will be included with your application, and they are verifying that the property you are applying for is located within the enterprise zone. The online application is broken out into these various categories, and we're going to review those really quickly. 
The first part is the background information. Um, again, the zone qualifiers, legal name, business address information. When you get down to number nine, you're going to see property identification number. That is the number that the local zone administrator utilizes for your application. Typically, it's a tax map number or something of that nature, but you need to uh, communicate with that local zone administrator or get that form completed so you have that. We no longer, again, we no longer require any um, hard copy of, back, of of application to be submitted online. Everything is done directly in the portal. But if you need a sample application available just to collect this information, such as for your CPA or yourself, there is a sample application that can be utilized on the application portal. Going, uh, continuing with the background information, the narrative summary, we want to know a little bit about your project, what it is, and then also who is the contact person and a correct email address uh, for the grant applicant. So if there are questions, then we are able to reach out to you. The place and service documentation, what is being used. Uh, so in part A, you're going to indicate that. And in part B, if there are any type of discrepancies or information that we need to know, such as uh, multiple addresses being shown on the place and service document or maybe a discrepancy on name, you're, there's going to want to be an explanation put in part B of this section. The qualified real property investments. This is uh, listing out those different investments under their specific categories. As you can see here, we have carpentry, electrical, concrete. This is just an example. And um, we do want you to be specific in that instance of making sure that the different parts qualified real property investments are classified correctly. This might come from an AIA report from your contractor, or it may come from the invoices themselves. If you have more than 20 um, categories, you can put those on an additional sheet of paper and you'll see under there number 20. We tell you to see attachment, put the amount, and you're going to upload that to under the uploaded document section. This is the qualification information. Of course, uh, number one, they real property was placed in service, should correlate with your final place in service documentations. And that should be at some point in 2023 because you're applying for a 23 calendar year uh, grant. The actual uh, dollar amount of qualified real property investment, that's going to be auto filled from the previous section. And also, I just want to point out 3C and number four. 3C is if you've received public grants or any other type of uh, grants associated with that real property investment, then you must subtract that amount from the qualifying because you can't really just what we call double dip. We want to make sure that we are reimbursing you for costs that you have paid out of pocket already. And then if you have previously received a grant and um, you are applying for the additional threshold amount, so for instance, you received $88,000 in a previous year and you um, are meet a new threshold and you can apply for an additional $12,000 to meet that $100,000 threshold or $100,000 cap, then you're going to want to put that $88,000 in there so that we know that your total requested grant amount would be $12,000. Because again, as a reminder, those caps are over a five year period. Uh, your CPA information, the CPA doing that attestation does have to be from licensed in Virginia. And so their information must be provided. And then the application information, uh, numbers one through four are the supplemental forms. You may or may not have those. Five, six, and seven, every applicant will have those. So you're going to make sure that you're going to check those boxes if those forms are attached to your application itself. And then this is section is the uploaded documents. There's one for each of the things we talked about, um, the CPA attestation report form, Commonwealth of Virginia W-9. And then of course, if you have any additional information like the qualified real property investment, you would put that under that last one. Password protected documents are not accepted and you do wanna upload these documents separately. The last thing you do before you hit submit is we want you to 
double check on your Commonwealth of Virginia form that you have put the correct address, et cetera, for the company. So check that box and then hit submit. Just as a reminder, this is not something that you can save and come back to. So you want to make sure you have all of your information ready to go when you sit down to make this application. The supplemental forms, if required, um, are the Enterprise Zone, Real Property Investment Grant Mixed Use Form. There also might be, as if the zone investor is a tenant, there are two different forms that may be filled out, or if the zone investor owns a space within the building or facility. So let's go over those real quick. For mixed use buildings, if the uh, mixed use, of course, you have to make sure that at least 30% of the usable square footage in the building is devoted to commercial office or industrial use. Common areas that are accessible by uh, commercial space are can be counted in that square footage, like a lounge or conference room. And of course, so if, if you're utilizing the mixed use, that must be completed uh, by the preparer of the measured drawings or plans for the work done to the reference building. That preparer of plans may be a licensed third party architect, surveyor, or drafts person, and is the responsibility of the CPA to review the status of that person's license during their attestation process. Grant coordination, so supplemental forms um, for tenants. This ensures that the grant caps are not exceeded uh, for the property itself. Uh, if the owners and tenants do not coordinate among themselves on those supplemental forms, then DHCD will determine the maximum grant amount available based off of the cumulative amount of real property investments made and the square footage lease owned by the tenant and investor. So basically we'll undertake the DHCD rules associated with that if those supplemental forms are not submitted for that property. So what are common errors associated with the real property investment grant application? Typically place and service documentation is not final or indicates pending work or a failed inspection. Uh, so for instance, if you had an inspection done in December, of 23 and you're trying to use and that inspection says well you can open however you have a few unfinished uh things that need to happen some handrails or other aspects and they're going to come back in january to provide your final place and service documents then if that was received in january of 24 the final place and service documents that means you're going to be applying in uh, for the next grant year so that's the most common mistake i think that is seen uh, place and service documents uh, for consecutive phases of project were received in different calendar years. That's kind of the same um, aspect of what I was talking about before. Multiple phases of work were completed on single building or facility within the same calendar year, uh, but you must only meet the minimum investment threshold once. So that's sometimes some common errors associated. There are, we do have additional common errors. Um, application spans multiple addresses, such so as a facility, but the CO only references one address. Uh, differences in the address from one year to another for a property. Please make sure that when you're entering property address information, you are using the same, uh, the same exact capitalization or abbreviation. So North versus N, Street versus ST, those are um, it, the system reads that. So we need to make sure that that is being utilized or being entered correctly. And if grant caps are exceeded due to address errors, confusion, the grant awards must be repaid to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, properties that are improperly identified as buildings instead of facility, that's also something that is a common error. And I think that might be the end where we got a few more, sorry, vague or conditional items listed on those qualified real property investments. So the breakdown of site work needs to include specifically such as excavation, concrete or general conditions, or also a lack of detail on those general conditional items. So if you list that, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, don't list just a change order, list additional flooring work as something uh, that is utilized. So now we have the question and answer section. Um, I think it was Tim, if I remember right, you you had a question associated with the building or facility. If you want to go ahead and ask 
that. Okay, um, we have a, a tenant that is uh, in the enterprise zone um, and they are expanding, they're adding to their existing manufacturing facility. Um, I assume that is eligible if it meets the investment thresholds? Yes, now you had said, but it is it connected or is it? It, it, is, it is a connected attachment yeah. to the existing building. So if I'm correct, that would be a rehab or expansion because it's expanding the footprint of that current building. Correct. Yes. So that does that answer your question? Yep, that's it. Okay, great. Um, Gray, Lane? So, um, hi, thank you guys for this information. It's very, very beneficial. I, I think that you kind of touched on it in the common areas um, section, but I have, uh, I started development and um, renovations on a uh, large building in Covington um, back in, in September. Um, and we hosted a couple events in 2023. And then the completion um, of the work um, is, is coming um, this week. So basically it spans two calendar years. Would we be able to, should we apply for 2023 and, and 2024? Or how, how would we work that? So there's going to be a dependent factor on that. It's going to be referenced back to your place and service documentation. And so you mentioned you had held some events. I don't know if they gave you a temporary certificate of occupancy or they something of that nature. Temporary, that's right. That We got a temporary certificate of occupancy. And then this week slash next week, we'll be getting our permanent certificate of occupancy. Okay, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Tori and Kate, but that would actually mean your final place and service document came at 24. So you're actually going to be waiting until the great year 24, which would be next year okay. in order to apply. A year from now. Okay, that's that's perfect. And the same with job creation as well, even though, I mean, we'll talk about that, but we we paid um, salaries and, and, and hourly wages in 2023. So it is possible that you could apply for those if those jobs qualify, even though you'll be waiting on the real property investment grant. And I think maybe Kate will be able to answer some of those questions when she goes through that. So why don't we hold off on those until then? Does that sound okay? Yeah, and that brings that up a good perfect. question. Thank you guys very much. Sure. Yeah. And Gray, that does bring up a good question. So even though you're not going to get your place, your, your final CO until 2024, you can still, um, take all the investment that was made towards that place and service documentation, even if it was in 2023, 2022, um, you can go across years. The, the date that we go by is when you get that final place and service documentation, but you can count all the investment that was made even prior to that year, potentially. That's okay. That's fantastic. That makes me feel very good. Thank you very much. Sure. Hey, uh, Kate, Tori, I kind of got a little confused on hands up. So okay. <laughs> do we? I had Paul. I think Paul's. Yeah, I had I had a question on the on the um, components of hard costs that you asked to be listed. Um, if you're applying for something between a two million and a five million dollar uh, grant, and you can list ten items that take you to three million, but it's not the complete project. In other words, concrete steel and all these other things once you get between them do you have to list all of them or once you get above that threshold can you can you stop once it you can demonstrate it's over two million but you're not going to get to five anyway yeah that, that's a good question so we we i mean you you don't have to um you know once you've made that um, we we recommend that you do um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, let's say you ha you have $2 million in, in investments this year that you're going to qualify for. Let's say two or three years down the road, you do in another investment of $3 million. If you don't include all of those in this first year um, and you do an additional expansion that would put you over the $5 million, but if you only counted, let's say you only counted a million of the $2 million in investment um, and then have another $3 million, that won't put you, you can't go back and say, oh, we actually had $2 million in the year that we applied before and then get us over that $5 million. Um, so that's one reason why. Another reason is we, we also like to see, um, you know, 
we have reports that we give out every year to the General Assembly that helps with funding for the program. To see all the investment that is incurred as a result of this program, we like to show that. And so as you, as you saw, there were some projects, we had some huge projects this last year. We had over $466 million in investments that were made to get grants for last year. So we like to show the overall impact of the program. Um, and so that's another, you don't, you don't have to, I mean, once you've met the, the, you know, you can stop there and, um, but, but we, we, we recommend and we would like you to do it if at all possible. Thank you. Sure. Um, Stephen, like I think Steve. you had a, yeah, Stephen's yeah, next. I did. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Tori. I appreciate it. A uh, couple questions. Um, I know that signage is, uh, something that doesn't qualify, but what about the electrical, uh, wiring that goes to the sign is that considered part of the signage and things like concrete footings for the sign is that come under concrete or structural or, or is it is there something that's specifically excluded in the yeah. sign or is it any I, appurtenance with the sign at all yeah i'll take a look at that i, I think we have some prior um precedents on some of that so i'll have to get back to you on that specific question okay. Um, so we'll get okay, we'll, back, no get back. We'll, we'll we'll note that okay, and get nope. get to you, Stephen. Yep. No problem. I do I do have a couple of questions if you don't mind. I'll try to be quick. Uh, specifically signage again. What about federal safety signs within the building? Um, is that I thought that was something that actually was qualified because it's a safety I don't think feature. This, so what no. exactly are what do you mean the set federal safety signage? Like OSHA's uh, required? Uh, 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 yeah, some, something in terms of uh, like a fall or a, a cautionary, something on the wall. Uh, that yeah, those those certainly won't. Those won't. Uh, I don't believe those would qualify. OK, OK. And like um, stream signs, those those things don't sign those. Don't qualify. OK, and and anything related to the sanitary sewer is not qualified at all. If That's it's on site, um, that that qualifies like for on site. Um, mm -hmm. We can't do anything. It's extended past the property and in like connection fees. Um, those do not qualify. Right, but the construction uh, on the property does qualify. I think, yeah, I believe so. Just like it's just like oh. water sewer. Yeah, I think it's fine. Uh, I was going to say, and and uh, following up with that, the storm water management, the storm sewer, as long as it's on the property. It's, it doesn't ha have the same requirements like plumbing where it has to be inside the building. Right. I mean, that would yeah, make sense anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got you. Right. And w just uh, if there's a warranty that's uh, invoiced separately from the work, like a war war invoicing for our warranty, that would be excluded, correct? Correct. Even though it relates to the work. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and lastly, thank you. Thank you for the uh, questions. Uh, time. Um, C stores have all this uh, structure around uh, the fuel systems. Now, obviously, the equipment, pumping equipment, that sort of thing wouldn't follow. But is there anything related to the uh, fuel systems, like the islands or the tanks and piping, that sort of thing? Does any of that qualify, or is that kind of all under the rubric of uh, equipment? I think we've done that allowed that before where the islands and like the, the canopy over the, I mean, it's the, and the, of course the tanks that are underground tanks are one thing, the pumps themselves, I don't think qualify, but like the, you know, in the, the island itself and the canopy that's, that's placed over that. It's, you know, some of the things like if the business closed, the things that would stay um, potentially, but, uh, and, and as long as it's, as long as it is considered real property and not, um, yeah, right. equipment, machinery, equipment, uh, personal property. Did, did I hear you say that the tank would qualify then? I think the underground, the underground tank would qualify. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And I think All I read, right. it, if we uh, need to double check that, Tori, I think I saw some language interpretation mm -hmm. we can check. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. I'll follow up with you, Tori. Thank you. My okay, only sure. regret is I don't get to. I don't I don't get to taste some of your daughter's uh, sweet treats, so <laughs> but I'm doing a great job. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Okay. Nice. Thanks All for right. your help. Appreciate sure. it. Sure. Okay. I think Beth, uh, Beth, Beth is next. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, this Beth Schulhoff with um, Brown Edwards. I have two questions, please. Um, one is on the application online um, format screen. This could just be a function of the slide, but is there more than one 
a way to add supplemental information. Like if I have over 20 um, trades and I need to send that extra Excel spreadsheet in um, with the 21st, 22nd, 23rd trade plus a lease, is there two different um, places to upload that? It looked like there was only one on what we saw. Um, I can't answer that because I actually screenshotted that. I screenshotted it to reduce it. If I remember right, okay. you remind me. I think there are actually a few spots for additional information. Okay, because I know last year there were, and I got, oh, God, if there's only one, we got a mess on our hands. No, so. no, it, it was just a, to make everything fit on one screen type Okay, thing. good, good. And um, next question, by public grant, you mean state, federal, and local, correct? Correct. All three. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Sure. Uh, right, Kim, I believe Kim. you're yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my one of my questions was also about the um, uh, Part Four Three C, the public grants. Um, I'm assuming also that that is like our we they would list their local enterprise zone incentives there. What if those are paid out on a fiscal year versus a calendar year? Those um, like like our city of Franklin and our county pays those out um, after June 30th for that previous fiscal period. So do we have to then calculate the portion that would relate to the calendar year on what we're doing for the state application? So you're saying like if you have, let's just say it's a, a landscaping grant that you gave them $2,500 for, um, they've already done the work and it got completed like at the end of 2023, but you don't give them the grant till after Ju July 1st of 2024 or June 30th, 2024. Is that correct? Well, no, I'm talking, we, we give things like machine and tool tax rebates. Uh, we give the discounted rebates, electric. Yeah, re yeah, rebates don't count. It's only if it's if it's a grant. So if okay. you know some people give a signage grant to you know for people that or you know landscaping grants, it's only a grant. So if it's a tax, quote unquote, rebate and things of right. that sort, those don't those are not counted. We, um, we also offer things like um, like free office space for a year yeah. while you're building your building. They don't do, they don't need to report yeah. that because it's no. not actual cash. Right. Exactly. OK. And then my other question is, is just about once you once you once a person establishes their base year, their their first year. So let's say it's 2023. What does the process look like for the remainder of that five years for that applicant? Is yeah. there a process that they go through each year um, as a follow up yeah, to their base year? Sure. Yeah, I think Kate will get into that in the job creation grant. Um, the, the next the next section that we're going to do so that'll probably answer okay. that question but if if not if you still have a question about that after that there'll be a another time for questions and answers after the, the job creation grant presentation uh, okay great thank you all right got a couple more questions one from jeff yes uh, my question was uh mainly just to make verify that uh, nonprofits can qualify as long as we yes. own the property is that correct? Yeah, the, the they can qualify the, for the real property investment grant. They do not qualify yeah. for the job creation grant. Right, right. OK, because yeah. um, we our uh, building went into service. Uh, we had a CO for February 2023 and we spent a little over a million dollars in addition to over top of the purchase price uh, to remodel. So I'm um, assuming right. that would qualify within this grant. Yeah, as long as the bill, yeah, as long as it's located within within a, an enterprise zone oh, in your locality. Yes, we yes. are in an enterprise sounds zone. Like, I've already okay, verified yeah. that. Okay. okay. Yes. Well, it sounds like it. Yes. Sure. All right. One more, a couple more questions. One from Tyler. Yes, I just have a couple here. So, um, going back to the five-year cap. So, if a company that owns a piece of real estate and the company that's operating, I guess, like the tenant, um. And this at the same address. I mean, would they, if the owner of the property made a substantial investment and then the tenant also did a substantial investment, I mean, can they both qualify for two separate caps of a hundred thousand, or would that not be the case? No, the the cap is tied to the property. So if the if let's say the landlord had already applied and and got the 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 cap amount at 
at uh, and got the hundred thousand dollars, the tenant would not then be able to if they yeah made some subsequent subsequent. We can take a look at your property um, kind of offline afterwards, Tyler, and take a look at it and see kind of where things stand with the property. Um, and there are some cases where um, you know the, the landlord made some improvements and then the build out was completed by the the tenant. Um, you can coordinate if and it's all done within the same year um, when they got the CO. Um, you know we've had some coordination amongst the the landlord and the tenant to get a portion, you know, kind of their um, prorated portion. Um, like one case, it was like 60% um, was paid by the landlord and 40% by the tenant. So they allowed the tenant to get 40,000 and the um, the landlord took 60,000. But it's always up to the landlord um, if they, you know, if they have enough qualifying expenses to maximize the cap, then they that's their their right to get the full amount and then um, they have to allow the, the the tenant to apply if there's anything remaining or if okay. they want to coordinate like that yeah okay but it's no it wouldn't increase it it would just divide it no. basically. exactly yeah. okay so basically if the same person owns both companies that doesn't help <laughs> <laughs> right right okay and one more question and i'm done um just to clarify purchasing a building inside of an existing building inside of an existing enterprise zone would not qualify for anything without any kind of renovations, correct? Correct. Yeah, the acquisition costs are not eligible for the in, in the qualified costs or qualified investments. Okay. That's yeah, there, may, there may be some there may be some local incentives um, mm -hmm. that might be available to you, but for the, the state grants, no. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. One more question from Megan. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for part three of the application, that itemized list of QRPI, is it sufficient just to fill out that fillable form in the application, or is the supplemental support, such as an invoice, needed to be provided or, or maybe just maintained by the applicant? Yes, yeah, so you will maintain that. That's something you'll need to show to your um, to, to the CPA as they're doing the attestation because they're going to be the ones that verify those invoices. But for the application itself, the only thing you need to put in is that you know that total amount for each um, you know each line item in the that you're applying for. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Are there any other questions? And I failed to mention at the beginning that we are taking questions and answers for after each section. So um, uh, we'll go ahead now and start with the job creation grant. And Kate's going to take that. And again, we'll have some questions and answers, uh, um, question and answers period after after this presentation. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Tori. Let's go ahead and jump into that job creation grant. Just like the Real Property Investment Grant, um, we are not accepting hard copies. Everything is submitted online in our online submission portal. All applications must be submitted in the portal by 1159 on April 1st, and that includes all supplemental forms, all um, required forms, and that CPA attestation. Again, this is what the portal looks like. Over to the left is where Mandy showed you you would submit your real property investment grant. You have the box in the middle for the job creation grant. You have all of the documents that you need. You have the link to submit and also the manual. Let's go into what is uh, the qualifying elements for a job creation grant. So of course you must be within the boundaries of an enterprise zone. You can check that with the local zone administrator or the director of economic development in the locality. Um, number two, in order to qualify, the jobs must be permanent full-time positions. They must be jobs of an indefinite duration. They cannot be seasonal or temporary positions. And the position or the employee must be required to report to work within the zone on a regular basis. For our purposes of the grant, a regular basis is at least once per month. If the employee is, uh, if the position, excuse me, is for um, stay at home, work from home completely, but there's no report to work requirement, then it does not qualify for the grant. The position must be normally scheduled to work either a minimum of 35 hours per week for at least 48 weeks, a minimum of 35 hours per week for a portion of the taxable year in which the employee was hired, or a minimum of 1,680 hours per year if standard fringe benefits are paid by a business firm. So that's if it's a salaried position. 
In order to be eligible, the position must be net new. It cannot be a churn position that was moved from one location in the Commonwealth of Virginia to another. So let's say you're a business and you have multiple locations and you shut down one of your locations and you send your employees from that location that you shut down to the other location. Those would not be considered new positions because those employees came from the other location. The positions must be um, for new or existing businesses who have created, excuse me, the grants must be for new or existing businesses who have created grant eligible positions over the base year employment levels. So this is where some folks get confused. So let's talk about this. The base year can be either of the two calendar years immediately preceding the firm's first year of grant eligibility. The grant year that we're currently in is grant year 2023. That's for businesses or firms that created new jobs in 2023. They may use base year of 2022 or a base year of 2021. That base year is your starting point. From, from this point, you're going to measure the jobs that were created, and that's how we're going to determine how much grant funding you receive. Any new business will have a base year employment of zero because it's new. There were no positions in that firm before the grant year, and they must meet a four job threshold for qualification. So just like those real property investment grants required a threshold amount, the job creation grants require four job threshold. That means that those first four jobs do not um, meet eligibility for the grant, and the fifth job triggers the grant, and the fifth job is where um, the qualification begins. The business must offer to pay at least 50% of the eligible employee's health insurance premium. So in order for a position to be eligible for the job creation grant, the, the firm must offer to pay 50% of that benefit. The employee can choose to waive the benefit. The business must meet minimum wage requirements. We're going to go into those minimum wage requirements in detail in the upcoming slides. And then there are some restricted positions with the job creation grants. And this is one very uh, this is one thing that makes it very different from the real property investment grants. Restricted positions include personal service, food and beverage, retail, units of government, and nonprofits, except business and professional organizations that are listed there. And as you can see, we listed out the NAICS codes. Um, there is an appendix in the back of the JCG manual that lists all the eligible NAICS codes and all the ineligible NAICS codes for the job creation grant. And you can use that for reference to check to make sure that the positions for which you are applying are eligible. Let's talk about those minimum wage requirements. So we are required um, by statute to determine the minimum wage based on the, the Virginia and the federal minimum wage as of December 1st of the previous calendar year to that grant year. So we're in grant year 2023 and we looked at December 1st, 2022. At that time, the Virginia minimum wage was higher than the federal minimum wage. So we're required to use that higher wage, which is the Virginia minimum wage. At that time, it was $11 per hour. So all businesses uh, qualify at 175% of the minimum wage, which is $19.25 an hour for our $800 job creation grants. All businesses who have positions at 150% of the minimum wage, which is $16.50 per hour, qualify for a $500 grant per permanent full-time position. And then we have our HUA and SWAM certified businesses. We'll talk about those in the next slides. They qualify at a lower wage threshold of 125% of the minimum wage at $13.75 per hour for a $500 grant. And it's important to note that um, this year, as with many years, we have new minimum wage requirements and that may affect previous grantees. Um, just because a company had positions that qualified in the past, those positions may May not qualify this year or in upcoming years, depending on the minimum wage requirements. 
So let's talk about those high unemployment areas. Um, we use the acronym, the acronym HUAs. Those high unemployment areas are determined by um, distress factors and a fiscal impact score um, that is based on certain statistics like their unemployment rate, their medium household income, and a few other things. So businesses that are located in the HUAs are eligible to apply for the reduced wage rate, and that's at 125% of the minimum wage or $13.75 per hour. You can see the zones in this chart that are currently high unemployment areas for grant year 2023. And again, any existing business that was previously um, an HUA applicant in one of these zones, they can continue to qualify at this rate for the remainder of the five year period. So that makes it a little different than if, if the position was qualifying um, at a different wage rate. Um, for the HUAs, if you previously ap uh, applied as um, a, a business firm that was located in an HUA, you can continue to do so. In addition, legislation was passed in 2021 that allows for SWAM certified, which is small women owned and minority owned businesses to be eligible to use that lower wage rate threshold, which is the same as the HUA threshold, 125% of the minimum wage or $13.75 an hour to qualify for that $500 grant amount per permanent full-time position. In order to be eligible for this reduced rate, reduced, oh, that's always a tongue twister, reduced wage threshold, the company has to have been a SWAM certified business sometime in calendar year of 2023. And um, we have the link here to look up that online directory for that SWAM certification through the supplier diversity um, agency. So we are currently accepting applications for grant year 2023 um, from businesses that have increased their employment over that base year by more than that four job eligibility threshold during calendar year 2023. We have um, one major new component this year and um, a CPA attestation is required for job creation grants except when the applicant has a base year employment of less than or equal to 100 permanent full-time positions and, and is a key word, grant eligible positions lower than or less than or equal to 40 permanent full-time positions. And that is new this year. It allows for smaller firms to qualify without having to get that CPA attestation. Let's look at this example of how to calculate awards. If you are a great year 2023 business that is applying, you can use 2021 or 2022 as your base year. So in this example, we're using 2021. And we are going to use the example of having 10 permanent full-time employees in 2021. By 2023, the grant year, there were 20 permanent full-time employees. And again, we're making sure that it's meeting all of those eligibility requirements. All positions are earning 150% of the minimum wage, all worked within the calendar year of 2023, and all 10 are offered health benefits equal to at least 50% of the premium. So for the calculation, you're going to take your 20 grant year employees and subtract those 10 base year employees. You're subtracting them because they are not eligible for the grant. Then you're going to subtract the four job eligibility threshold. So that equals six. 20 minus 10 minus four is six. And then you um, will have six grant eligible permanent full-time employees. So you multiply that six by your $500 grant amount for a job creation grant award of up to $3,000. Just like the real property investment grant, the grant term is for a five year period. In order to be eligible for those five years, the company must maintain or increase employment over that base year employment by at least five net new permanent full time positions. That's that one position over the four job threshold. And the first year of that five year period is the first year of grant eligibility. So that would be your grant year or your year one. After the first five year grant period, it's possible to qualify for subsequent periods. And then there's information here about what base year would be used in those subsequent periods. So let's talk about the job creation grant worksheet. This is a requirement to be submitted 
in the application portal as a document. It's an Excel sheet. We're going to look at it and go through it. The worksheet should be filled out from left to right because there are some columns that once you put the information in that column, you move to a column to the right and it takes information from the left column to make the information on the right. So it's important that you do not skip columns. You move left to right. You do not change any of the formulas. Some cells are locked to protect the formulas. Some cells are hidden on purpose and cells will turn red to signal potential area errors, excuse me, and will turn black if ineligible. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in our example here. So the JCG worksheet is something that um, is submitted by the grantee. A lot of times the CPA will, will assist with this. Um, you're going to look at I-9 and your I-9s and your payroll documents of your employees. You will see that the first column, that orange peachy color is an employee number. That is just a one through however many number um, for reference. The next column says included in CPA sample, yes or no. That's a column specifically for the CPA only, and it's so that they they can keep track of which employees were included in their sample that they do. The next column is the employee name, and the next is the last four digits of the social security number. It is important to note that you may use another identifying number for your employees. As long as it's a four digit number and each one has their own identifier and there are none, excuse me, there are none that um, are the same, then you can use that instead of social security numbers. You'll see here in the first two rows, you have Patrick Henry and Patrick C. Henry, and they have the same last four digits of their social security number. The reason that it turned red is because that's the worksheet letting you know that you have two um, entries that have the same social and that it's something that you need to look at and possibly change. The next three columns are for your base year information. The first column is the first work date in the base year, and then the last work date in the base year. Once you enter those, the blue column, um, the blue column uh, creates itself by the months that are entered into the first two columns. It's important to know when you're working with a job creation grant that it's not based on person, it's based on position. So if Tori was in a position from January to June of your calendar year and he moved on to another job, and let's say you had that job open for a month before you filled it again, you would get um, a prorated amount of the grant for the January through June. And then we would leave out that month that there was no one in the position. And then if you filled it in July, you would get um, a prorated amount for July through the rest of the year in which that position was filled. And that's why we ask for the first work date in the base year and the last work date in the base year. Similarly, you're going to enter the first work date of the grant year and the last work date in the grant year. The light blue column is um, calculated for you. The next column, you put a yes or a no, a Y or an N for if it's offered health benefits. If you happen to put an N in there, it's going to black out the next column because that position is not eligible for the grant. You can see that. Um, down um, further where you, um, let's see, I can't see what row it is because it's, uh, it's smaller for me right now. It's up around row 11 and 12. And then for the next row in the yellow, that's where you're going to put the hourly uh, wage rate for that position. If it is blacked out, it means that it is low and it's too low to qualify for the grant amounts. And once you put that in, um, the other fields, the hot pink and the light orange and the orange will, will calculate themselves to tell you um, which grant um, rate you are eligible at for that position. You will see that sometimes um, you might have a, a person that's listed twice. The only time that that would be um, something that you would wanna do would be if that person um, started the year with one um, wage and then it was increased or decreased in the year and you need to list them again to list the other um, wage rate. This is the second page of that Excel worksheet that we just looked at and all of column B is calculated for you once you enter those numbers in on the first page. So you can see that um, 
Row three is the number of all of the equivalent permanent full time positions filled by the firm in the base year. Then you have that number of those filled by the firm in the grant year. And then you have the number that qualify at the 175% of the minimum wage, which would be an $800 grant. And then you have those that qualify at 150% of the minimum wage, which would be a $500 grant. There are two separate worksheets, one for a regular job creation grant application and one for those companies that are in an HUA or that are SWAM certified. There are two separate worksheets um, and you will submit those in the upload portion of the job creation grant portal and I will show you that in a moment. You will include all employees that are filling permanent full-time positions in the base year and the grant year, and positions that should not be included are those that we've gone over that are not eligible. If they are not permanent, not full-time, not meeting that report to work requirement, if they are any of those positions that are ineligible like food and beverage, retail, personal service, or their churn positions they removed from another location in the Commonwealth. Wage info only needs to be listed for your permanent full-time positions hired after the base year through December 31st of 2023, the, the grant year that have been offered benefits. And an employee given a raise during the grant year must be entered, entered on separate lines for each wage rate. So let's talk about what you would do if you had a salaried employee. You would divide an employee's annual salary by 1,820 hours. And in order, to, in order to qualify, they must have 1,680 hours total. You may include shipped premiums and commissions. However, you may not include bonuses or overtime. So here is what a calculation would look like. If you had an employee with an annual salary of 32,000, your conversion rate is 1,820 because you have your 52 weeks per year, um, times your 35 hours per week for 1,820. So you're gonna take your $32,000 salary, divide that by your 1,820 hours at 1758 per hour, for example, and that would give you your wage rate for that employee to enter into the worksheet. You may want to print your worksheet and save copies of them for yourself so that you have those to look back on if we are to have any questions or if you need to edit those. Let's go over those required materials. So once again, it's due on April 1st, 2024, just like with the Real Property Investment Grant, you're required to submit the Commonwealth of Virginia W-9. We cannot accept the federal IRS form. We have to have the Commonwealth of Virginia W-9. You'll have your local zone administrator review form. Um, you have your LZA to sign that form to specify that you are located within the zone your applicant declaration form, your CPA attestation form, and your worksheets. And I believe we have slides on all of these as a reminder. Um, Mandy went over this earlier, but it's very important that you um, make sure that the remittance address is the address where you want your check to be sent. The legal address may be different than that remittance address. So let's talk about what that application looks like. The first part is the background info. It's very similar to the, the information that Mandy went over. If you've applied in the past, you had to fill out Form Easy RPIG and Form Easy JCG and submit those online. But we asked for the exact same information in the portal, so we no longer require that. We do have a sample application page on the portal, so you may want to go through and fill out that sample application so you have all your information ready to submit, because unfortunately, you cannot go in the portal and enter some information and save it and come back to it. You have to put in all the information at one time and then submit it. It's very important that on number seven of the JCG application that you choose correctly whether you are doing a standard job creation grant or whether you are in a high unemployment area or you are a SWAM certified business. This is very important because the rest of the application will be affected by the choice you make since we have different wage rates that are requirements of those two different types of applications. In part two is where you will enter your qualification information. 
The grant year is uh, 2023, that's entered for you. You're going to check which year you are currently applying for. And it's very important to remember that when you enter in number three, your base year, that base year is gonna stay the same every time you apply. Um, so your base year for this grant year will be either 2021 or 2022. And then number 4A is where you're going to start entering those numbers. A lot of those numbers were auto calculated on your worksheet. So uh, 4A is the number of, excuse me, let me go back. I didn't mean to click that, is the number of positions in the base year. 4B is the number of positions in the grant year. 4C is the, is, is the uh, amount of um, subtracting line A from line B. And then you're going to, for number D, for letter D, excuse me, you're going to subtract four from line C to, to subtract those that four job threshold. Even further, you're going to use those amounts that were on the back of that um, JCG worksheet to enter in the amount of employees that qualified at the 175% level and or the 150% level. And um, also in this slide, it's showing you the difference in what the, the worksheet will, the, excuse me, the portal will look like if you are a standard job creation grant or if you are applying for an HUA or SWAM certified amount. Because of course that HUA and SWAM certified uh, business will qualify or can qualify at the lower wage rate of 125% of the minimum wage. Furthermore, um, you will look at um, number six here, um, and that is where you will have your information of the amount of dollars requested at each different wage amount and the total amount of job creation grant requested. Part four, um, excuse me, I'm getting my letters and numbers all mixed up today. Number seven is where you're just doing a little mental check to make sure that you did not include any ineligible positions on that job creation grant worksheet. And then part three is where you'll enter your CPA's information. This is important too, because although we'll have it with the CPA documents, if you are not exempt, um, we reach out to the CPA when we reach out to you if we do see anything that needs to be changed on your application. So for both grants, the Real Property Investment Grant and the Job Creation Grant, um, after we start reviewing those on April 1st, we have a certain amount of time in which to do our first review. We will reach out to you if there's something that looks incorrect, if you're missing a form, if something is not signed, and we'll give you two weeks to get back to us with the correct information. We will change it for you in your application, and we work with you to try to make sure that you get that application corrected so that we can get it um, completely reviewed and you will be eligible for the grant. Just like for the other grant, you have um, this part of the portal in which you will upload all of those files that are necessary. And you have um, additional information slots. There's more than one where you can um, upload those documents. This is that screenshot again of that applicant declaration form. Um, there's some things that are for both grants and some just for the RPIG or the JCG. Um, you do not have to fill out the narrative summary for the JCG. That is more geared for the RPIG, um, but there is specific information that's a requirement of the JCG applicants. Here's that LZA review form. You will have the LZA sign that and you will upload that document into the portal. So let's get into detail a little bit about that CPA attestation. Once again, this past year, we have made the change that the attestation is required um, for all grants unless you are exempt. And the, the qualification for being exempt is that you have a base year employment of 100 or fewer positions and you created 40 or fewer grant eligible positions. Um, the waiver eligibility must be determined each year. So just because you may be um, eligible to be exempt um, and have that CPA attestation waived on your first year, maybe you had a great year and you increased the amount of employees that you added to your business and you're over that 40 jobs. You would not be eligible to be exempt from the CPA attestation the following year. You would have to have the CPA attestation.
So that was a very quick rundown of the Job Quick Creation Grant, and I am ready to take your questions. Kate, I don't know if you can see the chat, but someone uh, asked, what qualifies as a food and beverage position? Right, so um, the best way to to check that is to look at the NAICS code. Um, I believe I had that listed in one of the previous slides. Um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I can get back to you about what that slide is um, and give you the NAICS code for that position. Yeah, so basically uh, any restaurant position, um, you know, because that is a food position, beverage position, yeah bars, um, things of that sort. There, there can also be some um, types of businesses that qualify otherwise. Um, I don't know if Kate mentioned this earlier, say, let's say a hotel um, that is a qualifying under the NAICS, but any uh, food and beverage positions in that. So if you have a restaurant within the hotel, um, those positions that are part of the restaurant, um, those do not qualify, um, but other positions may. What other JCG questions do you have? Yeah, you can you can either um, you can either raise your hand or type it into the chat. Um, someone's asking, we are a nonprofit. Where can I find our NAICS code? Uh, so nonprofits do not qualify for the. I mean, there there are two specific, very specific NAICS codes that are are nonprofits. But basically, I think the the qualification for that is it's a national nonprofit. It's like the headquarters of a national nonprofit. So um, like local United Ways or you know other smaller nonprofits typically will not qualify for the job creation grant, but they may qualify for the real property investment grant if you own a property and make improvements uh, to that to a building or build a new building. Here's a slide with those codes and like Tori said, the the um the organization that you talked about, Tori, and also the professional organizations, I believe, include something like the Chamber of Commerce or another professional organization. And that um, the previous question for the food and beverage, the NAICS code is 722. And just like Tori said, the reason that we go by those codes is because um, your business may qualify, but you might have positions um, in that business that do not and positions that do. So it's by specific position. What other questions do you have? If there are no other questions, we are going to jump into the CPA attestation part of our presentation. This part of the presentation is specifically for CPAs who are carrying out the agreed upon procedures. So if you are not a CPA, um, I recommend maybe not staying for this part because it might be a little confusing if you're trying to figure out your um, part of the grant and then also listening to the CPA's part. So we'll let a, a few folks jump off if you would like to. We appreciate you coming to our presentation. All of this information is available in our manuals online um, and you're um, welcome to reach out to us anytime with any questions that you have or if we can help you in any way. And yes, here are our email addresses and phone numbers if we can be of assistance to you. Mandy, are you ready to jump into the CPA procedures? Sure, let's get it going. All right, so as Kate said, uh, we're gonna go over the CPA agreed upon procedures. So just as an overview, the agreed agreed upon procedures test and report is on the assertion of a business qualified zone investor and basically their qualifications to receive the enterprise zone grant. This is reported on an attestation report by the CPA, is required for all real property investment grants and most job creation grants. And Kate just went over the exemption or the eligible exemptions uh, 
with her presentation. The CPA does have to be an independent of the company. So sometimes companies have CPAs that work for them. If they are paid by them to do the books, that is they are not eligible, but it could be someone who maybe does their taxes. So they do, and they have to be licensed in Virginia. And again, just as a reminder, all documents have to be submitted by April 1st of 2024. And I say this on behalf of all CPAs that do attestations, if you're still on here, they do not want those documents the day before. But so be working on that. The report itself, the findings must be reported on the required CPA attestation report forms. And those forms and the use of them are have the support of the Virginia Society of CPAs. We do ask that US CPAs do not retype the procedures or submit the findings using any other documentation other than what's provided by DHCD. And attestation report forms for both grants are available on that Enterprise Zone online submission portal. The findings um, reports are submitted that do not state the findings for each procedure are considered incomplete. And so the AICPA professional standards set forth in these sections states that practitioners should report all findings from the application of the agreed upon procedures. And furthermore, under that other section, 201.26, specifies that practitioners should avoid vague or ambiguous language in the report findings. And you can find examples of in a like inappropriate descriptions of findings in that section itself. So this is also goes through some of uh, examples. So based on professional standards, the providing one's initials or no findings is not acceptable. It does not constitute an adequate description of findings, and that application would be deemed incomplete. So an example here is the CPA will inquire of the sources of all grant monies used to fund the qualified real property investment by obtaining management representation and determining federal, state, and local source grant funds or grants of public funds were not used to purchase items on the scheduled qualified real property investment. So no grant monies, the finding response would be no grant monies were utilized for this project or received $3,500 in local grants. That amount was listed in the application and subtracted from the total qualified real property investments. So again, we're asking for more detailed description, not something is no findings. Submittal requirements, again, it must be submitted and uploaded with the online application under the additional attachment sections by April 1st, and any that applications submitted without the required CPA attestation are considered incomplete and late. Late applications um, are typically not processed due to allocation of funds. If submitting more than one application, each application and associated associated materials must be submitted separately through the electronic submission system and just step-by-step -step process the application confirmation when submitted you'll get a successful submission of the online application via email and then as Kate mentioned when we start our review you'll get notification of deficiencies and then notification of resolution of deficiencies. So jumping into the Real Property Investment Grant applicant responsibilities, they must provide the following information to the CPA uh, in order to be able to do the CPA attestation. All invoices and receipts for the qualified real property investments that are capitalized or expensed by the zone investor and all final place and service documentation issued for the completed qualified real property investment. Also, the applicant is responsible for providing the CPA with any of the additional forms, supplemental forms. So for mixed use buildings, they do need to provide the measure drawings as we reviewed during that RPIG presentation uh, for the building indicating the square footage and use of the building along with that application or that supplemental form. For zone investors applying as owners of space within a building, the closing documents are deed of trust indicating the building square footage. And if zone investor are applying as tenants, the current lease agreement indicating the building square footage. So that all goes into the amount, the qualified real property investment and square footage in determining your eligible amount.
What are the CPA attestation responsibilities? They do need to report the following. All required attachments are complete, including all supplemental documents. The zone investor only included qualified real property investments, and all costs were listed as either capitalized or expensed by the zone investor. Um, the list excludes real property investments that were funded from public grants, federal, state, or local sources. And the real property for which the investment was made has been placed in service fully during the applicable grant year of 2023. Additional, the CPA is responsible for reporting, if applicable, the mixed use building, that the square footage info and use is accurately indicated on that supplemental form. And of course, if applicable, the zone investor um, owns space within the building or the zone investor is applying as tenants have indicated the correct square footage info accurately on those forms. So each, um, each attestation has procedures to follow. So procedure one for the real property investment grant is the attestation of all completed, um, basically completed application and all required documents are completed, that they are signed and ready to be uploaded. So this includes the Commonwealth of Virginia W-9 completed and signed, the local zone administrator form completed and signed, the applicant declaration form completed and signed, and any copies of all that final place and service documentation. The CPA also needs to make sure that it either has the same physical address as referenced um, and was approved, issued, as complete in 2023. In addition for procedure one, they also, if applicable, are going to attest to completed sign and notarized supplemental forms that include that mixed use form, that if applicable, the multiple owner form, or the tenant owner consent or tenant coordination forms. And those, of course, are only applicable depending on who the zone investor is, and so the CPA able to attest to those different documents. Procedure two is the attestation of those qualified real property investments. So the CPA is going to read through all of the itemized list of qualified real property investments, as well as review those invoices and receipts to determine that only QRPIs are listed. So qualified real property investments, um, just as a reminder, include expenditures associated with the hard costs associated with construction or expansion of that building and that is being used for commercial, industrial, or mixed use. It can also include excavation, grading and paving, installation of driveways through um, but only up to the property line, landscaping, and land improvements. Um, in case of cost categories that are listed on that schedule that include more than one type of work, such as dry, so for example, drywall and demolition, you do want to break down that work into those different trades, including the category, um, so a breakdown of that work included in such category obtained by the CPA to read and assure that all of those costs are QRPIs. The CPA will also report any items whose qualifications are uncertain, including that exact dollar amount of the corresponding QRPI submitted with the online application. And the CPA is also going to compare the schedule of qualified real property investments to the general ledger industry entries to determine those items of costs listed on the schedule or to charge the appropriate capital asset account or expense account. Continuing on in procedure two, uh, the CPA will obtain and read 100% of the invoices, receipts, AIA reports, or any other relevant documentation of the construction expenses. And they are going to compare those documents to the dollar values presented on the schedule of qualified real property investments and report on whether those charges agree. The CPA will also obtain and read part three of the qualified real property investment of that RPIG application and the contents of their attestation report to determine whether those total QRPIs reported um, meets applicable minimum investment threshold. So essentially just making sure that minimum threshold was um, met through those qualified real property investments. And also uh, inquire of any sorts of grant monies used to fund any QRPIs uh, from the management representation. 
The third procedure is the attestation of place and service documents. The CPA is going to review those documents that the uh, qualified investor provided to them and work is complete and up to code is evidenced by that place and service documents. OK, and making sure that that place and service date indicates the calendar year in which the zone investors applying for the grant, grant year 23. The CPA is also going to read and ensure that those documents um, and no other documents were issued or is pending. There cannot be any pending um, work to be done or temporary COs. And in cases where the final place and service doc was only for a portion of a building or facility, uh, the CPA will read the qualified real property inv investment amounts to determine that make sure that it only includes the work completed through that portion covered by that place and service documentation. Continuing on that final place and service uh, or final certificate of occupancy, whatever it is, the CBA is going to compare the physical address on that final CO to make sure it matches the application. Uh, also read the final CO, determine that the date of the issuance is within the appropriate calendar year and that it is not a temporary or pending. Uh, in case of a shell certificate occupancy, the CPA is going to read the application to determine that the zone investor is not a tenant of the building, because at that point, of course, they would need some type of supplemental form. And also they will read to determine the names listed matches the name on the application. So the CO uh, information should match the name on the application. If that does not happen, the CPA does determine, um, if not, the CPA will determine the required explanation is included on that part two section B of the online application. If you remember, we had that up earlier. Continuing on for the final place and service document, making sure in cases where the building was in a continual service during the rehab or expansion, or there was no change in use or final CO required, the CPO is going to CPA. I'm sorry. We'll read the final building inspection, determine that the physical address matches the physical address in the application, and they also will read the final building inspection, determine the date of issuance again. Um, read the final building inspection to determine that the final inspection is marked as approved. There's no pending. And also if that final building inspection determined that the name listed matches the name of the investor. Again, if there is a difference that needs to be reported in part two, section B of the online application. Continuing on when place and service document is a third party license inspector report. So in some cases, the loca locality will not require a building permit or other permits for the work that's being done. It could be a roofing job. It might be a uh, paving of a, a parking lot, something of that nature. If that's the case, the CPA will read the official letter from the building code official, determine that it references the physical address and states that such permits were not required for the work. In addition, they will also read the third party inspector's report that was required as a final place and service document, determining that the physical address on the report matches the physical address for the application, and also that the third party inspector's report determines that the date um, that was issued during 2023 for the grant year. The CPA will also read the third party inspector's report to determine that indicates all work was was completed during that year. And of course, if there are any discrepancies, again, that needs to be reported on part two, section B of the online application. The CPA will make sure that that is a part of their attestation, that that is complete. As far as part four, uh, or procedure four for the attestation, this goes along with the square footage for mixed use buildings. When it is a mixed use uh, building, the applicant has to provide that mixed use form. And so the uh, CPA is going to check that the form has been completed and the prepare of the measured drawings and plans submitted to the locality. Also check that it contains the professional seal or notarized signature of the preparer if it's not an architect who has a license. If no formal drawings were required by the locality of the zone investor prepared their own measure drawings, the CPA will determine that a licensed third party or contractor has signed and sealed that certifying that at least 30% of the usable floor space in the building is devoted to commercial, industrial, or office use. So the CPA will determine that in part two, box four of that mixed use form.
Procedure five is if the attestation, if the uh, there are owners of the space in the building, again, when the building has multiple owners, the CPA is going to determine square footage information indicated from the closing documents or deed of trust that they provided to the CPA. The CPA must also determine that the zone investor has coordinated qualification with one another um, and uh, or otherwise DHCD will prorate the procedures based on our procedures. The CPA is going to determine if the applicant has indicated own space in the building and that this correct supplemental form is being completed and signed. And also the CPA uh, should compare the form to any backup documentation provided by the applicant, such as closing documents, deed of trust, and report those findings on their CPA attestation report. Continuing on, Part of uh, the CPA's responsibility is also making sure that the forms are mathematically correct and also that um, any supplemental form agrees with the grant requested by the zone investor on the real property investment grant uh, that otherwise there may be proration depending on what forms are submitted. Is there something else? Procedure six. Attestation of tenants in a building. When an applicant is a tenant in the building or facility, then the CPA determines the square footage again and um, information indicating that the current lease agreement is accurately indicating indicated on that tenant owner consent. And the, the uh, zone investor must provide the CPA with access to the lease. And this purpose is to ensure the zone investor has obtained the consent of the building owner and has coordinated qualification with all other tenants in the building. And otherwise, again, DHCD will use the prorated procedures if that has not been done. The CPA will determine if the applicant is, um, sorry, I don't think I finished that one, Kate, I'm sorry. Yeah, CPA will determine if the, if the applicant has indicated their tenant in the building as well. And um, again, ensuring all of that, attesting to it on that CPA form or attestation report. Procedure six continued. The CPA determines that uh, the supplemental forms have been completed and the owner of the building gives consent to the tenant to apply for the grant. So that must be uh, signed off on on that supplemental form. And again, determine that the information is mathematically correct and the supplemental form agrees with the grant requested by the zone investor on the application through the online application itself, which may be on a sample application that the zone investor is utilizing with the CPA. I tried to make that really fast so that we can try to get you all done by 12. And I'm sure I stumbled over a few words, but let's go ahead and open this up for questions regarding real property investment grant attestation procedures. Beth? Oops, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to double check. I have one client that um, did not receive a piece of equipment that was necessary for a small portion of the building, and they have a final certificate of occupancy for the entire building with the exception of this one tiny little piece. And it's very clear on the CO um, that this is the case. Um, and I know that the costs do not include anything for this tiny space. Can I still apply this year? So you're indicating that they have received final place they've received all their final place and service documentation for this facility except for this small area am correct. i understanding that correct correct i mean i i'm gonna say yes tori kate you all have any objection well, to that if the, they, yeah they can only apply for the portion that they receive the place and service documentation right. for correct so this new this other part that they don't have that for they cannot include any of those costs in the application in the qualified investment right 
And if they did so in the future, they were, of course, and if they do that, the, the yeah, if they get that this year and they call it, they meet the threshold, they could maybe, you know, if they don't already max out the, um, the, the cap um, this year. Okay. So. I just wanted to double check on that one. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, you have your hand raised? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so for the, um, the building grant, you talked a lot about the investor versus the tenant. Um, if the investor is one entity and the tenant is another entity, but the same people own both entities, do they still qualify? Yes, you would apply as whatever the entity is that capitalized those costs would be the applicant. If it's the same okay. company, typically it's not usually the same company. Sometimes they'll have like the you know, the one that owns the land and then they have an operating, you know, for the operating company. So, so, um, but they could be, so it, it's actually the taxable entity. So if both of those are like a single member LLC. Um, it's the taxable entity. So if there's kind of a, an overarching organization, we can probably answer that more fully if you, if you send us an email and have any additional questions about that. Okay. Um, but it, you know, I mean, it's like I said, it's two separate entities and, and you're right, like the, the operating entity leases the building from the other entity, um, yeah. but they are all the same people, you know, yeah. the same owners of each entity. So right. that's still yeah, the entity, the entity that's the landlord or the, the, the entity that that capitalized right. those is costs the would be would like, yeah. yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay. Usually the, the tenant and landlord coordination is when they're two separate entities, like there's a landlord that owns the property and then, you know, let's say a, a veterinarian clinic um, rents the rents right. the property and made some build out. So if they're the same entity uh, you know, or the same owners, it would be the entity that owns the building. OK, all right, thank you. Sure. If there are no other questions, we're going to jump into the job creation. Grant CPA agreed upon procedures while well, we have about 17 minutes left. I think that's plenty of time. So once again, we wanted to just bring to your attention this change, um, the CPA attestation exemption for the job creation grant. Um, business firms with base year employment of 100 or fewer permanent full-time positions that create 40 or fewer grant eligible positions are exempt from the attestation requirement. That is new, and so we just keep bringing that to your attention. The job creation grant worksheet must be completed each year that the firm seeks qualification, regardless of whether the attestation report is required. The business firm will provide the CPA with the following. The first is that uh, worksheet. So if you are a regular JCG, you will have the JCG worksheet. If you are in a high unemployment area or you are a SWAM certified business, then you will be turning in that HUA SWAM worksheet. Um, and that includes all the employees filling those permanent full-time positions in both the base year and the grant year. You should list those employees by um, alphabetical order order and you will have the base year employees listed first followed by those grant year employees that are also in alphabetical order failure to, failure to provide a completed and accurate list of the all employees and the dates that they were employed along with their wage rates may result in an under or overpayment of grant funds and in that case the commonwealth would require the grantee to return an overpayment to the treasurer of virginia Employees receiving raises or also decreases in pay during the grant year must be listed separately um, for each uh, payment amount. Applicants may not use their average wage rate or ending wage rate to represent an employee's annual wages, so you would have them listed more than once. 
I-9s and pay stubs or payroll records indicating the first work date, last work date, and wage rates in the base year and grant year for each employee listed on that worksheet where applicable are necessary. Um, health benefit documentation, including any written benefit waivers that you receive to prove that you did offer that health benefit as well as the business firm representatives must provide his or her signature on that applicant declaration form. And that form is for the applicant to fill out and sign saying that all the information that you're providing is accurate to the best of your knowledge. Um, it's also to ensure that no retail, food or beverage or personal service positions are listed on the worksheet. All employees listed are permanent full-time positions, have not been churned or moved from one location to another in the state, and all employees listed on the worksheet, grant and base year, must report to work um, at least once per month to meet our report to work requirement. The JCG attestation procedures are structured to ensure that the company is not a personal service, food or beverage, or retail establishment. The company only includes permanent full-time positions in the base year and grant year on the worksheet, and that the wage rates for the net new equivalent permanent full-time positions in the grant year are accurately indicated. And it also is structured to ensure that the employment dates and wage rates for positions listed on the worksheet are accurate and identical to the information on both payroll and personnel documentation. Let's jump into those procedures. Procedure one is the attestation regarding prohibited positions. The CPA will read the NAICS code listed on the online application or the sample application part one, box five, to determine that the NAICS code listed is one other than those codes for retail, food and beverage, or personal service, which are not eligible. If a business is not a retail business but has retail positions, the firm is eligible for JCGs, but only positions that are not retail, food, beverage, or personal service can be included in that worksheet for the purposes of qualifying for the grant. Procedure two, attestation of permanent full-time positions on the worksheet. The CPA will follow the sampling procedure explained below to obtain the employment documentation and the worksheet for employees filling permanent full-time positions during the base year and or the grant year. The CPA will report the applicable procedure that was followed in establishing a sample. So here are our rules for sampling. Firms with 100 or fewer employees filling those permanent full-time positions, the CPA will obtain a random sample of the documentation for 20 employees <clears throat> excuse me, on the worksheet and read to ensure the start and work dates for such employees agrees without exception to the information provided. If there are 20 or fewer employees, the documentation and worksheet calculations for all employees will be included in the CPA sample. Firms with more than 100 employees, the CPA will obtain a random sampling of payroll records and health benefits documentation for 20% of all employees shown on the worksheet. The CPA will read to ensure the start end work dates for such employees agree without exception to the information provided using random sampling techniques. The random sampling will be based on the use of a table of random numbers. The CPA will first assign each employee listed on the worksheet a unique identification number. Then the CPA will select cases for the 20 employees or 20% 20 sample when their identification number corresponds to the number chosen from the table. The CPA will indicate in column B of the worksheet which employees have been selected to be sampled. That is that column with the Y and the N for yes or no for sampling. The CPA will stop selecting cases when they have reached the desired sample size. If an identification number is selected more than once, the CPA will ignore the repeats. For non-reconciled errors, should the CPA find any non-reconcilable errors, any unexplained difference between information on the documentation provided and what is entered on the worksheet in the sample population, then that CPA should repeatedly select 20 employees or 20% sample from the original population until the subsequent sample procedures produces no non-reconcilable errors. The CPA shall submit by name any non-reconcilable errors found during this procedure in the attestation report. 
If the client chooses to revise the worksheet and application to remove the non-reconcilable items, the CPA shall read to ensure that the revised worksheet has omitted those items and there are no resulting changes from the original worksheet. Procedure three, attestation of required documentation. For each employee from the sample population, the CPA will compare the JCG or a JCD HUA SWAM worksheet for base and grant your employment information listed on the required documentation. So your I-9, payroll uh, for both base year and grant year, and your health benefits enrollment information. In the case of a business in a qualification year other than its first year, the sample should only include the grant year information. The base year employment should only be sampled in the first grant year along with grant year employment. And this is our first year making that um, statement um, noticeable for all of you. So if you are in any year besides year one for job creation grants, then you do not have to do a new sampling of that base year employment. You only have to do the sampling for your grant year employment. Procedure three continued, the CPA will obtain the sample population I-9s to determine the base year and or grant year employee's name, social security number, address, and start date of employment. In cases where the I-9 was signed prior to the actual hire date, for example, required as part of a job application, the CPA will read and compare the I-9 in conjunction with the supporting employee payroll documentation and attest to the hire date of the employee. Payroll records for the base year and or grant year employees, including first and last payroll records for the time the employee worked in the base year and or the grant year, the CPA will compare the employee's name and employee number, where assigned with the information included in the worksheet, read and compare records to attest that the first and last work date for each employee within the base year and or grant year correspond to those dates listed for the employee on the worksheet and compare the wage rates as indicated on the first and last payroll records for those sampled employees hired in the grant year, which are net new employees, with the specific wage rates listed in column O of the worksheet and report any differences. If any employee received raises or even a decrease in pay during the grant year, the employee must be listed on a separate line for each wage fluctuation. Do not use their average wage rate or ending wage rate. The CPA will read the worksheet and determine that employees with wage fluctuations during the grant year have been listed in the spreadsheet as many times as payroll records show those fluctuations. For sampled employees with information in columns P, Q, R, and or S, the CPA will read the employment documentation to determine that the employees reflected on the worksheet are permanent and full-time. If the sampled employee's wage rate was converted from salary to hourly, the CPA will determine that it is mathematically correct by dividing the annual salary inclusive of shift premium and commissions by 1,820 hours. Health benefits. The CPA will obtain and read the signed health benefits enrollment agreements and compare insurance coverage materials indicating the employer contribution to payroll documents indicating employee contribution. The CPA should compare the individual employee information on these documents to the information presented in column N of the worksheet indicating that they were offered or received health benefits and for which wages are listed in column O as such employees are net new over the base year employment and report on these findings. The CPA should report all instances where the firm does not offer to contribute to at least 50% of the cost of health insurance premiums. For employees filling grant eligible permanent full-time positions that have declined health insurance coverage, the CPA will obtain and read the employee's signed waiver of health benefits. For firms that self-insure their employees' medical claims, a copy of the firm's policy signed by the EFPFTP with wages listed in column O is acceptable documentation. If a business does not make health insurance benefits available for new permanent full-time positions until after a 90-day employment period, then the initial 90-day employment period during which benefits are not available 
can be included in the worksheet? This is a question we get every year. So if um, there is a 90 day time in which the employee does not have health benefits for the first 90 days, you can still include those 90 days in the worksheet. The firm should list the first date and last date that the employee filling the permanent full-time position met the wage requirement for those employees whose health benefits were effective after a specified employment period, provided they were offered by the start date. The CPA will read the qualification information on part two of the online application or sample application page to compare whether the information entered on part two, boxes 4A through B, and boxes F, excuse me, boxes 5, E through F, corresponds with the auto-calculated values in the following cells of the worksheet and indicate any discrepancies in the attestation report. So you're going to take that second page of that worksheet and look at that column that is auto-calculated from the numbers that were entered into the front of the worksheet and make sure that the same numbers are entered on the sample application page or the online application page and that those match up. That was a very quick rundown of the JCG CPA attestation requirements. I would now like to take any questions that you may have. Not currently seeing any questions. I have put up the slide with our information, with our email addresses and our phone numbers for you to contact us. Also throughout the presentation, you might have noticed the pictures. Those are all pictures of projects that received real property investment grants or job creation grants in the last two to three years throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Last call for any 